<laughs> that's scary. That's scary. Uh, anyway, uh, we've, I've had fun looking through. There are, of course, thousands and thousands of paintings, but one can choose about the fashion story. Uh, the older paintings, as you already know, are all probably due to, from the Catholic Church, uh, paying painters to do it, or wealthy patrons who paint painters to decorate chapels and so on. There, there are some new, a few new painters where that isn't the case. But they've been just picking out a few um, was fun, but it was all, you know, something that is, everybody may not be familiar with. Um, it, uh, I, I actually started picking out the paintings from myself. Um, uh, there's two sources I want to mention that I saw paintings, but then I went to try to find where the painters paintings come from are Christian Century at the archives, thanks to Carol, and the uh, visual scripture uh, commentary, visual, com visual commentary on scripture. I went to their archives um, and found paintings. So and then I went to the museum and I was quite some. So the first two we're going to show you, and Lynn's going to talk about them, are from the day we commemorate the day when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. So Lynn, uh, do you want to? This is. This is part of a book, or was part of a book, and it's a page. Pardon me. Well, it's they're running out. Just gonna ask. There we go. Four. Oh, all right. Is that better? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hold it close to your mouth. Okay. Ah. Uh, all right. Uh, this is an illumination, and what that is is a part of a book, or it was a part of a book, and these were sizable books, so that this page, for example, is about 16 by maybe 24 or 25 inches, would be a large book, and illustrated by uh, people who are not individually named. So many of these, in fact, most of them, you really do not know who this artist was at the time that the illumination was done. In some cases, they are individually made by one person. In other cases, some of the pages are done by, in other words, several different people working on the same thing. This one was done at a time when uh, there were fairly, mm, what should you say, methods by which they generally illustrated things in a monastery and they were frequently commissioned for different purposes. So this is an illustration of a particular passages in the Bible, for example. So you can see the entry of Jesus into the, uh, into the area. And over here, we're starting to see things that are a little different because you know, originally everything was more flat. In other words, now they're starting to, artists are starting to pick up the idea that well, we can make these things look a little bit more three-dimensional. And of course, they can do that with shading and all kinds of other technical, what should I say, technical methods. And there was a considerable amount of, uh, I guess I would say, we always tend to think of these people who are working on things in a monastery as being very solitary people and that they don't have a lot of uh, what you, uh, cross ideas. In other words, they're not acquainted with people in other parts of the uh, country or even in another area of, the, of Europe at the time. But some of them got around pretty well. This artist, I think, probably did because he was a little in advance of some of the others. Now he's starting to take up new techniques. 
And that's about all I can say about this particular one. I think they're extremely beautiful. Most of them are in museums now. Frequently, you don't get a chance to see them unless you're into a place where they have them displayed with very careful lighting. Um, pres preservation is a very big concern when you're talking about things of this age. They don't want them to get faded and so on. So um, those of you that have had an opportunity to visit one of the museums that has these sorts of things, it's like getting into the great secret vault. And uh, I wish we had better access to them uh, because they're individual masterpieces as I think of them that way at any rate. Is there all of the paintings which you all better if you turn the lights off? But I don't know how we can turn the, how to turn the lights oh, off. Actually, if you all, it, does anybody know how to turn the light off? No. The motion I would say, I well, have, isn't there any way to, to do it? Because it, oh, it's a little better. I would, I would say, I about this thing is much better. <laughs> Sharon, you can go the next slide. Wow. We'll do that. <laughs> In the background, could we, could we go back for just a minute? Oh, I'm down there. In the background, you see a representation, sort of, of Jerusalem, because Jesus is supposed to be entering Jerusalem, but he's a little bit outside, I guess you'd have to say. And these things are just magnificent when you do see them. They're very, very brilliant, brilliant. So when you see them in this lighting under these conditions, you just don't get a real feel for how colorful and gorgeous they are. William Blake is an English artist much, much later in time. And he never really, um, some people classify him as a romantic, artist or part of the romantic period, but I've seen it also described, oh, well, he was part of this mannerism and various different things. So like many artists, he evolved over time and he allied in some different kinds of ideas. He never had during his lifetime much success, really. Uh, at least I have read that. But on the other hand, you see his things today and you can say how successful is an artist whose work is in museums and even, even in many, many uh, libraries because he did a great deal of illustration for books and so on. So if you have a chance to look at his things, many of them are extremely strange. He is a person who was supposedly uh, believed in, in visions, he had visions, and many of them were really religious visions. So his illustrations for and paintings show a lot of that sort of thing. Some of them are just almost incomprehensible. Uh, up on the table here, I did copy off on the computer some uh, illustrations that are from books. And he did a whole series of these things, Bible verses, where they were illustrated. He was an etcher. And so, of course, those etchings are generally in black and white. They can be done in colors, but for book illustrations, the purposes of etchings were used principally in black and white. And they were small because they're done on copper plates to be printed in an average size book or bigger than average size book. So you're getting small illustrations with a great deal, a lot of detail. This beautiful painting um, is unusual. Uh, but not unknown. He portrayed the figures that he thought most important, much larger, and all the little people are sort of subsidiary people. You see Mary Magdalene over there on the right, and presumably a vision of Jerusalem. I am not so sure that I can recognize that as Jerusalem. I think it's something of heaven and the beyond and what happens later, but it's not too terribly clear. I don't know the size of this particular painting. And when you look at these things on a big screen like this, it's difficult to get, I think, necessarily a feeling for 
what they actually look like. Because if the, the original piece is small and it's blown up like this, it changes the whole, uh, what would you say, the coloration and the density of it and so on. So there he is. But as an English artist, he was a contemporary with people like Constable and so on. Uh, he illustrated things by Shakespeare plays that were uh, illustrations of parts of plays and so on, as well as poetry. So he was involved with the literary world. But he was always very poor. He and his wife would do these things almost together. She helped him with printing uh, and, and uh, printing the etchings that uh, were sold in various places. Yes. He also, uh, he was a, he said he was a literary teacher. He left a couple of poems that you might know that he wrote, uh, Little Lamb, Little Lamb Who Made Me. And he also wrote the poem about the tiger, 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 Where You Write in the Forest Tonight. That was kind of a visionary poem. Right. So his, his poetry as well as his painting. And it's kind of amazing that he was such a wonderful poet as well as a painter and artist. I think it's a strange thing that he had as much exposure as he did with different people and was not considered a major artist in his lifetime, or at least it appears that he wasn't. I think he's more appreciated now than, than he was. Yes, I don't know how to feel about Yeah, that. he's kind of a mystic, I think, and uh, lots of poetry, I think. But uh, anybody else know much about him? Yeah. This, I, I'm not going to talk much about this because you probably are, have seen it a lot. It's El Greco, it, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was on the cover screen there. And some of you probably know about El Greco, the Spanish painter who all the elongated places. So it's easily recognizable. I didn't even put the year. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I did. Uh, the mic. They were having a meeting with a feeling. Uh, anyway, I'll, I can talk pretty loud. Okay, the next one, Sharon. This painting uh, is by uh, Giovanni Bellini, and it turns out that he is a brother-in-law of a later painting I'm going to show you. It was so interesting. There is a wonderful. Um, a YouTube video about this painting, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this uh, art museum curator, she said she sees a figure in blue, which is probably John. She said she saw that on a poster. They just took the copy of the figure, and it made her realize that she wanted to be an art historian, an art curator. I mean, the whole, just the, that little figure on the big poster. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful painting. The screen here is not, doesn't show it up as well as it should be. But obviously, uh, looking at the disciples below, who, as you know in the story, have fallen asleep. And she points out where the arrow is, where the arrow is in the painting, but it's probably Peter and he's probably snoring. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's um, in a close up, if you, we can, we can't, I can't enlarge the man, but a close up, you can probably see it anyway. They assume it's Peter snoring and the other disciples is asleep. And this artist also, remember this is the beginning of the Renaissance and he knew about developing landscape. He was a landscape artist. He was also knew the, the, how to draw people correctly and the beautiful light, like she pointed out, uh, the light shining, shining on the back of Jesus in prayer for his clothing is lit. And that walk is kind of like a desk to, or it looks kind of like a desk where Jesus could lean over in prayer. Um, look at the landscape. And as you, as you know, in the story, an angel appeared. Can you see the angel in the right, top right? He's like a, a, in the close-up, which you can do at home with the computer, he looks like a little cupid. <laughs> but anyway, he, 
the angel is there and in the story he comforted Jesus in his agony as knowing Jesus knowing what is about to happen to him. Also notice the soldiers. Yes, we need them to change the battery. Yeah. <laughs> there are soldiers in the background coming that are starting to come to arrest Jesus, which is in the story. The city of Jerusalem is on the mountain there. Of course, these none of these painters have ever been to Israel, so they just have painted it from their memory. Um, there is, I don't know if you, there's a kind of a picket fence on the bottom right. What else do you notice? Yes, yeah, Susan. Well, the landscape kind of reminds me of New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, he's an Italian painter. He's from uh, Verona. <laughs> So I don't know if he saw a landscape like that or imagined it because, you know, we, we know they didn't travel to the site. So there might, it might be somewhat reminiscent of an Italian landscape, but it does look like a desert type in New Mexico. Anything else? I like the colors, how the blue of John's, the blue and the blue of Jesus the robe with the light shining there. And I wish we could see it better on this kind of ship screen. But any, any other things you notice about Look this? Look at the top of the hill, that's right. I mean, that's a city, I think, on the left. On the right. right. Underneath the angel or something. Oh, underneath the angel. I don't know. My guess is that's an Italian tower. The hilltowns <laughs> in Italy. The hilltowns in Italy all have a tower. Yes. It, it, okay, let's just say it is. It's a tower it's power in the distance. But he definitely, by this time, they had caught the artist's new perspective and they knew how to land, landscape, how to draw things and paint things in landscape. <laughs> What would we do without our pastor? <laughs> okay, uh, Sharon. How many of you know this artist? But if, that, if you hadn't saw, seen the name, of course, you saw How many of you recognize her? Okay. Have you ever been there to see the, any of you in Padua? Have you been there? You saw it? Yeah. I drove by Padua in my 20s once, and I wish I saw. <laughs> but if you know, um, and Lynn might talk a little more about later about the fresco. This is a fresco in this chapel in Padua, Italy. A wealthy patron hired G Giotto to paint the walls of this fresco. And each painting is just breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, the technique of the painting. We'll talk about, you could see the blue. Uh, I, there's also a wonderful video about this painting on, on YouTube. Uh, the blue was the most expensive color. And in time, it, in, during the time it faded. So that's why the blue is not in good condition. And they, they couldn't redo it. Also, if you notice the helmets, helmets of all the soldier, they are kind of brownish there. They originally were silver. And so that's just deteriorated. But to, can you say something about the chapel when you saw it? Well, it's it, it's very small, and there are I, I forget the number, but there the whole build, the whole wall and ceilings are covered with his uh, frescoes. It's just amazing. Uh, they only let about twenty people in at that time. It's time uh -huh. entry. Temperature uh, control, temperature control uh, so that you can't uh, you have to buy tickets. Ahead of we bought tickets online and ended up getting 13 extra tickets. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, oh, I wish I'd known I could have flown up. <laughs> and we sold them in a gift shop. You sold them? <laughs> yeah, because it's so hard to get tickets. Oh, oh that's amazing. Oh, I just, yeah, I wish I'd seen it. It's it, it just, he was, Jocko was already. Famous as a, and he became wealthy. Mike, did, I see Christ has a halo. Who's the other? Halo? Yes, all the disciples and Christ have halos. And if you look, um, if you look at the left halo, that's who. What does he have in his hand? 
Yeah. It's hard to see if he has a knife or sword, and he's in the process of cutting off the ear of one of the soldiers. And uh, what's interesting, too, is about the composition. Uh, first, of course, the robe of Judas and how, how that robe is right in the center of the painting and how he's because he's holding Jesus. I just I tried to get a close up of this picture, but I couldn't it wouldn't come out clearly. The eyes, if you look at the face of Jesus, I, you can see it that far away. It's just beautiful. And if Jesus has this loving, forgiving look in his eyes, it's not full of hate, which you would think of due to our Judas, who is betraying him. Uh, but Judas looks, Jesus looks right into his eyes in this loving way. It just, it, it's just beautiful to see a close up of this. If you want to go home on your computer, you can look this up and maybe make it close because I. I maybe I don't know if I copied it. Also, what's unusual is the man in the cape in the front. There's some printing there. I couldn't I couldn't get a print a copy of this without the printing. But we, see, the man is holding a, a piece of a robe of somebody. Well, remember the disciples ran away, and it says somewhere that uh, one of them grabbed the robe of one of the soldiers and they ran away without their clothes. So he's grabbing, so he's probably one of the soldier's men and he's grabbing the robe. But that the Giotto showed him just with his back to us, I think it's just amazing. And so the, yeah, the only two that are, um, have halos would be Peter and, Peter, of course, didn't run away right away and Jesus. And like the others are all soldiers or men, you know. And the face, the face of Judas, I wish I could really show you in a close up. Uh, oh, that top thing is it? Uh, the whole, oh, the horn. Imagine it's, I, I don't know. Any other thoughts what the horn might be? It looks like the chauffeur that's oh, worn on the high holidays and he sends his Passover. Maybe that's why they have say that again. Show it's called a chauffeur uh S H O F A R. And they don't I've it's seen other pictures of that bar more. Yes. I think originally the colors might have been brighter. This this is, I mean, this is a poor reproduction that was a brighter when you saw it. I remember blue, blue, yeah, just the bright blue. It just everything in the whole chapel. Just blue. But it's very subdued. The lighting from the windows, of course, is, is controlled because mm -hmm. um, they don't want to fade, but uh, it's beautiful. And then the one of the Annunciation of the birth is often shown, birth of Jesus is often shown. And of course, Giotto, this was, this looks kind of stylized to us. Uh, but in those days, Giotto was the first one, like the beginning of the Renaissance. He was the first painter to paint people in a more realistic way. Each face in there is different. He used perspective. So he was revolutionary to his day. Even to us, it still looks a little stylized, but in this in his day, he really brought changes to art because he was the first person to paint in more of the Renaissance, more realistic lifestyle without everybody looking all the same or odd sizes. You know, they it looks realistic. So that's another reason why he was so revolutionary and so became so famous in his time. I, I think I read he became quite wealthy, but, but the begin I remember my freshman college class, just the, the artist going on about he was the father of the Renaissance in Italian in art, Giotto. So I said, they not it be that revolutionary looking, but in those days, since everybody was more the Byzantine art style or that we saw earlier paintings. Any other comments or things you notice? Okay. Oh, this is 
This is a close up I tried to. It just didn't come up that I forgot I had that in there. Uh, you can see a little bit the kindness, the beautiful face on Jesus there. I just think it's just so beautiful. And Judas, the Judas is look. I'll say a little yeah. bit about the first one. Oh, yes. Lynn, would you want to come up here? It's in the sure. book now. Lynn has researched more about I left, the I left a little bunch of papers on the table there for anybody who wants to look at it. There is a small picture of this church. And uh, of course, you can't tell. You may think of it as being a small church. But imagine that it was entirely covered on the inside. Every every inch of it. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Um, was covered with these frescoes. And uh, Giotto didn't do this by himself. He had a few helpers, about 40 people worked on this. And they um, had to do it very quickly. Fresco is a material in which you are mixing the pigment into the, into the wet plaster and applying it. And there's a lot of fresco that's been worked over afterward to touch up uh, parts that they have to deal with where seams occur between one batch uh, of fresco and the, and the next. Also, there's been quite a bit of touch-up work done on frescoes, particularly in the areas where the blue paint was, was. And the reason that the blue paint is in such poor condition is the chemical makeup of the uh, pigment doesn't do well when it's mixed with plaster. Certain colors are stable in that kind of a mixture and others just plain deteriorate over time. So you will see frescoes in which the original blue is not actually there anymore, but it was a beautiful at one time bright blue and it's been touched up extensively. Some of you may remember a few years back when there was big cleaning of a Sistine Chapel, and they were going to uh, clean all of the Michelangelo um, paintings, frescoes, again. And people were appalled when they did this because they had made a decision that they would return them to their original colors, which were incredibly vibrant. And over the years, people have become very used to this kind of grayed down, sort of dirty look, I guess you might say. And they were shocked when they saw that. This was the way they were turning out. There were claims that, oh, well, you've overcleaned it, you've ruined the whole thing, and so on. But in fact, uh, that wasn't the case. They were trying to return to its original appearance. And of course, we don't think about that now. You take a picture of something and you accept the idea that it's somewhat or like, like it used to be. Frescoes were done way back. And they were done by the Romans, they were done by the Greeks and the Syrians and people in other countries. So we don't know exactly, but in many cases, they didn't use that type of brilliant color. They were more subdued in color because they used more earth tones and pigments that were, were very different than people were getting into by the time of the Renaissance. But the most important parts of it. Thank you. Yeah, and it's it's paint mixed in wet plaster, right? Lynn? That's yes. What, yeah. Jen. So it becomes a part of the wall oh, itself. So, I think this is you. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. All right. I'm not sure about this one. Well, well big we can both talk about this. It. Okay. We can both yeah. talk. About this this piece has it's not very big. It's a small piece of painting. It has about thirty people in it. Look at them. They're, no wonder they're so bad together, all in the little page. But here, there's a great experiment with perspective. Now, artists are getting involved with perspective, but they're also distorting it to make it work for them as far as the composition. So you look at this and you say, well, the perspective is a little bit off. Or is it that he does this so that he can frame the figures and compact them into the scene that's very vibrant, very scary, really. 
Pretty scary. Uh, here's Mary. She's blue. She's wearing a blue robe on the left. And John has his hand, he's still touching her. Over on the right, we have various and sundry different people. Who are these people? Who are these people? And Mary Magdalene is the one in the red dress, sort of halfway up the image, and she has her hands raised up in the air. She's not very happy about what's going on here. The Lord Martine might have been a student of Giotto one time. They lived up, uh, he was just a few years younger than Giotto, and he's from Siena. Oh no, he he grew up outside of nearby near Florence, but he there his most famous painting that you've probably seen on Christmas card is the Annunciation. A lot of gold and Mary is kneeling there and the angel appears. Very famous painting. Uh, it's again, I think it's a beautiful painting, but the colors here just show the, the beauty of it. But the, and, the, and you can't see the, the beauty on the faces of the painting. Um, but also the, the reds and the blue and the color and the little children, you know, of the bottom, Jesus carrying the cross. Any, anybody know more about Simone Martini or comments? Think, what else do you notice in the painting? Yes. I'm noticing the guy in yellow directly above Jesus' head is there. Yeah, and he's in that doorway of the building, but he looks like he would, it, he's just so immense. It's like that, uh, what you said about perspective being. Honored, but also uh, and so he's huge. He's in that doorway. That's he's true. Really standing in that doorway. He's, he's, uh, he's huge. He would fill up the whole doorway. But and it's just kind of he's part of the crowd in front. I don't know. I'm just, he's yeah, kind of stuck, I think, it is, and it, it's. I wish we could see the whole painting more clearly. And of course, the halos are all disciples or Mary or people that are. Mag, you know, there's just a few, but the others are townspeople. And the little children at the bottom, you just met a fellas. I think it's interesting that they place these pictures in what looks like a medieval setting, right. that the people looking at it would be familiar. And obviously that building would have been- No, no. At Jesus time. And they, they really didn't know. Well, yeah, they, they, all the backgrounds are what, of the scenes that they knew at the temple, I think. And of course, their clothing too, as now Jesus' clothing as a robe, but the soldier in front looks like a medieval knight or something with a little skirt type thing. Yeah, the fact that the children have shoes is, is uh, probably not the way it was. Yeah, they probably were barefoot. You know where this is hanging? Pardon? You know where this picture? Uh, it is part of a, they call it a politic. I think it's a panel of a church and I, I don't know where it's hanging. I need to, I should, I read more about him last night, but it's uh, like, it's of those folded back panel altarpieces and there's paintings on the back and the front of Jesus' life, but I, I, I need some to, information. yeah, it might be, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I have to put it down now. I know, I was wondering where it is, and it's, anyway, it's part of a, a panel where they have folded up all the folded up all the pieces, where there's paintings, I think it's called a polytic or something. Yes, it would fold in so that it's closed, they're considered to be portable, and they would be part of somebody's private <coughs> original, so you're not, <coughs> you're, you're looking at something that's been separated from the rest of its Piece. You still see some of them in churches today if you're in the Catholic churches. We're so unfamiliar with what Protestants have gone visit these old churches, we don't know how these were actually used. And they were used in people's private chapels as well, mission by some wealthy person. And they expected to take them with them as they moved around the countryside.
Uh, go ahead. This is fascinating to me. It's very large for, compared to its real size. These are one of, and I'm gonna show you two of them. One of four set of small ivory carvings. I'm putting the microphone. I imagine about this small, as much as you can out of a piece of ivory. And it's the earliest, I believe it's the earliest Christian art ever found. It was made in the year 400 and they found it in Rome. I don't know if ruins are, I, I, all, I found, all I read is that it was found in Rome and it's the earliest Christian art. And these four small pieces of carving um, with the next one. Um, and I just think it's just amazing that they're that old. They are now in the British Museum part. All right, the British Museum, no, no. They are found in the British Museum. Anyway, you can see they're also called Mascal Passion Ivories or caskets. So both names are used. I don't know the meanings of any of that. Uh, but they're found in Rome in about 420 CE. Uh, um, Jesus and Judas is shown as a pair. Do you see Jesus? And you, I'm sorry, do you see Jesus? <laughs> uh, do you see Judas is what I meant to say. Um, is he probably at the a lower right? Is that there's a money, I think he's with the money bag. Yeah. What else do you notice the five before I show you the, the next one that goes with this one? The rock the cap up in the corner. Yes. Say, say that, pardon? Pilate's washing his hands. His pilot is washing his hands. Anything else? The rooster is right above. The rooster is right above, right? The rooster. It's the guy pointing at Jesus. He's pointing at Peter. He's pointing, pointing at Peter. He's pointing at Duke. Oh, oh that, yeah, could, so yeah. that could be Peter. Yeah. I'm sorry, and I thought it was Duke because I saw that. Okay, so anything well, else? It could be one of the servants that say, you're from Galilee, or you're from Galilee. No, so the stories may not go with that. Now, I almost have what I, so it's, look how it's light the crosses. <laughs> and it looks like it's made out of styrofoam or something. <laughs> Obviously, but for a tiny, tiny painting, how they, you know, they carry the cross, they couldn't show the heaviness and the, the size of the cross. So this is more symbolic. Um, but, and also the expression on Jesus' face. He doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to be in agony. Would you show the next one that goes with this? This is, of course, the crucifixion. And this is where Judas and Jesus is a pair, they said. And also, in one of the commentaries I read, the expression on Jesus' face is kind of peaceful, not in agony. When they also pointed out that Judas and Jesus died the same day, is that right? And so Jesus and Judas is a pair, one on one end, another on other. Uh, the the leaves on the tree to notice, of course, Mary and the disciples are below. Anything else you know? But when you think this small to carve this out of ivory in such a small piece. The two others that, that, like I said, it's one of four. I did not, um, I didn't show that. I don't have pictures of the two others, but they're the other events. It just that it just the way Jesus is hanging and just kind of seems peaceful. But, um, but to, to have such a small car, you know, to do it generously. Any other things you know about it? The bag of money. 
And on the bottom of Judas, Judas, the feet of Judas, all the coins are spilling. It's also interesting that the figure of Jesus looks much more substantial. Yeah. Than in a lot of other depictions of the crucifixion. I mean, it's more stocky. Uh, yeah. Not the frail looking Jesus that we oftentimes see on the cross. Yeah, they're stocky and yeah, healthy looking actually. And again, it might be the size, but doing this in a very tiny, tiny piece of carving, I don't know how hard it would be to carve out of ivory in the first place. But that it's so old, I think it's just fascinating. Uh, Sharon? This, the, the next three paintings, I'm going to show you the same subject of Jesus bound with the crown of thorn on his hand. They put a robe around him and the scepter in his hand is, you know, the, the story. This one is made kind of like a, this was probably a devotional, private devotional painting for some rich person who maybe had a small altar in his home. Uh, the expression, I think, is just so beautiful on Jesus' face. You see small drops of blood from the crown piercing his, uh, his skin. Anything else you notice on this painting? Do you think it would make somebody, bring somebody comfort and peace if this were in your house? Or what, or what do you think the uh, reaction would be? If you own this, or you have bought it, I, I just, I don't know. I don't think it. It's not a huge painting. It's a smallish. The artist was probably a follower of Leonardo da Vinci already, and you can see similarities in how da Vinci painted. Uh, and also it reminds me of Rembrandt a little bit with the black background, was how the face almost comes through in the light. I don't know much else about Solaria, the, paint, the artist, except that he was a follower of Dimension in, in Italian. Anybody else, any comments? But, okay, the next one. There's a little something different. <laughs> you can tell about when this was made. What do you want to look at? Take a few minutes and look at this and then tell me what you notice about this. Ronnie? In the World War One, right? In the middle of World War One, the 1918s. And a pandemic. Pandemic. By a German. By a German. Did anybody know what it says? Is euch nicht Christus erschienen? Has not Christ appeared to you? Is it a sketching? It's a woodcut. Wood and apparently, and you know that I don't see the, the crown, but the woodcut, notice one eye is real small, like maybe he was punched an eye. The nose is like a block of wood. The lips, it just, it's a, a woodcut, but done very kind of violently in anger. And when I read about this artist, it's part of the German Expressionist movement. This artist, Karl Schmidt Odlov, he was a painter before, and then the war broke out, and he was conscripted, and he served three years on the Eastern Front. So you can imagine the suffering he saw and the, the, how it affected, his, it affected his life for the rest of his life. 
When he can return from the war, he could no longer paint, but he did a lot of woodcuts. And many of them are images similar or Christian images. I don't know one about what faith he was. I'm not necessarily a Catholic faith, but he he did um, these is this one. Oh, it's 13 by 29 inches. It's part of eight woodcuts. Okay, his face we already discussed seems like it wouldn't. His eyes, eyes swollen and squinting. Both eyes are black red rectangles, and the nose is just a square stub. Um, the forehead where 1918 is written is usually the name for I I N R I, which is usually for Christ. Um, and the question when did did, did not Christ uh, appear to you? Um, his shattered nerves made him unable to paint. He only did woodcuts, and 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 in the end, he turned to Christian themes. Um, later, when the Nazis came, I read that he they destroyed and confiscated six hundred eight of his work. And uh, he was expelled by the Nazis from an art academy. He might have been a teacher. I don't know what if he was a student or a teacher, because then he would have been older for the art academy. But obviously, the Nazis did not like it. Yes, sir. I'm just making this up. Yeah, make a comment. <laughs> but if the Nazis did you know, confiscate everything, the previous painting, my first thought of all, it doesn't look very Jewish. When you said it was maybe a follow up with Ardo, but then you know, it's it, this looks very much like a black man. Oh, that's an interesting comment. Um, yeah. I wonder if that's why yeah. he was. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I want to briefly show you the next one that's also kind of a modern one, the same theme. This is a very this is a modern painting. Martin Sumbaji, he is Indonesian, as it says, from he lives in Bali, and he does these little weathered boxes of scrap wood, and he used for um, the crown of thorns, he used barbed wire. The crushed tin can is for the the communion, you know, the, the wine, and just the dripping blood. So it's a very modern take, and he want he feels he wants to take off. He wants to take the Christian story to the common people. And there's another one at the end, which also shows that. But he did many, there are many, many paintings that he did that if you look up Google his name, uh, of similar paintings of the of Christ at the end. Okay. Okay, this is the, the main thing I show you. This is called the Zeno, San Zeno altarpiece in uh, uh, Verona. And this altarpiece was the whole, the paintings on the altarpiece were raided once by Napoleon and they carried it back to France and later they were returned, except what we're gonna talk about is this very bottom one, the bottom middle of the crucifixion. And that one, I guess it's now hanging in the Louvre. So the French did not return it. So we'll, we're going to look at that bottom one. But I just wanted to tell, show you where this next painting came from. This is uh, by Andreas Mantega. And before, remember the beginning of the Bellini, where Jesus was leaning and praying in the garden. This is actually his brother-in-law. And there is a family of painters. And, uh, and also it came up, I think it was featured like in Christmas century as a magazine one. But it's a really uh, interesting painting for the style and the symmetry, the composition. The composition and how everything is symmetrical, uh, of course, with the crosses. And on the left, you, Jesus's head is facing the repentant thief and the unrepentant thief is well, he's to Jesus' left, right? I'm not that, so I have to get. So on our left is the repentant thief. And on the, on the right, um, on our left is, of course, uh, probably John, 
on the right is the um, Roman soldier on horseback and he's looking up at Jesus and maybe he's the one who's saying, truly you are the son of God. On the, our left, there are the women sleeping with probably Mary. On the right are Roman soldiers, some of them are totally ignoring it. And on the bottom, you see that um, they rode the soldiers gambling over the robe of Jesus. Remember. So they're gambling on the bottom. This, oh, I was going to find this figure is so interesting. You just see part of the figure in the painting. And then the composition is just spectacular on this painting. Also, the city of Jerusalem in the back and the sky that it's kind of a bright, shiny yellow, I mean, bright blue sky, uh, just with some clouds appearing. It's just a quite remarkable painting. I can see what the French was. <laughs> any, any other things you notice in this? What's interesting to me is that it, it is uh, on paving. <coughs> um, usually uh, the, the scene of, of the crucifixion is on a rugged mountain. Um, yeah. And this is, clearly it's got an handicap wrap. And of course, those hills, the hilltop town again. A tower. Yeah, and the tower. The skulls on the left. What did you say? Tomb. I think it's a tomb. A skulls. A okay, tomb. Yeah. Maybe that's. Maybe that's the tomb. Actually, I think I've not noticed that. It might be the tomb where Jesus will be buried. I mean, it could be. Which sort of. Yeah. Okay, Sharon. Uh, this one, uh, Tillman Riemann Schneider, a German. How many of you have seen one of his works? You, lots of them in Germany. Have any of you been to Rothenburg, Germany? Yeah. Okay, there's a big church there, and in the back of in the back of the church, you have to probably pay a little bit to see it. There's this huge ball carving of Tillman Riemann Schneider's work. I mean, it's huge. He was one of the most prominent wood carvers in Germany, and uh, he's very famous. And there are pieces all over. Germany, the central Germany. He's from Würzburg. And when I saw this painting, because I didn't, you all familiar with the Pietà by Michelangelo, and I figured we don't need to talk about that because everybody knows that. But this one is, I think, just as beautiful. And this is um, now in near Schaffenberg, and I used to live near Schaffenberg, and I don't know if I ever saw it or not, but it's so long ago. <laughs> so I wish I'd like to go back there, take another one. But I've seen other pieces of Riemann Schneider there. It's just astounding what he could carve out of wood. And uh, if you if you notice the, the face of Mary, it's it just anything else to notice anything else about her, about this. It's probably almost life size, I'm thinking. I didn't have it in my notes, but I think it's nearly life size. It's always so interesting to see this, his work, because it's one of the areas that was really ravaged in war. And the fact that so many have uh, survived. survived. Yeah, they're, they're quite a few. Amazing. Although many of them were hit, mm -hmm. you know, buried. Yeah, they place. could move them. Yeah. The Rothenberg one, yeah, I mean, it's on the tour. If you go to Rothenberg, it just was not bombed, so it's still the walled city. So it's very, it's lovely. It's full of tourists. But that church, you kind of have to know where, where to go in that church to see it in the back. But it's like a huge wall of carving. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable what he did. Yes. It's interesting that Jesus is so much smaller than Mary. Yeah. And, um, this is probably done before the Reformation, so he's probably not Lutheran, but Catholic. 
and it might have been part of the cult of the area, but the area was just moving oh, larger. That's an issue. That's a good point. Yeah. And I think he did others too. There's some uh, there's another Keita where other men are standing around. Um, this fighting. Okay. It's yeah, this and this is probably in just not a very famous church or anything. I just it just says me on Schottenberg and I thought, gosh, I did like my <laughs> I don't remember. I might have seen it though. My former students just did uh, a whole book on culture. That's right. You yeah. sent me that. Yeah. Uh, so Richard Schneider and Rosenberg. They could say specific identity in the late medieval city. And she thanked me in her forward to the book. <laughs> <laughs> To write a book on this is a race, an amazing student and, and who uh, was fluent in German at the time she was born, and basically, and uh, this is her big study. The book is $99, but I just did to buy it. <laughs> and to say it, she thanked you. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what a wonderful trip. Okay, the next one is going to be a shock, and I want you to, I'm not going to say anything, but I want you to think about it. The last one. It was also, I think, in Christian centric ones, but what do you think? <laughs> no, the title is actually, or it's, is the title is Aeneas, and then they, neither male or female, which is the description of God. It's sort of a, a shock. What do you notice about Jesus? What's he wearing? <laughs> this is a Philip Emmanuel Garvey is a Filipino artist. Lives in the Philippines. Lots and lots of painting. He wants to. He resents the white takeover, you know, the dominant people that took over the Philippines, and he wants to bring religion to his people. It says that Jesus is supposed to be dark, like darker skin, somewhat like a Filipino, but I don't think you can see it in here that it's darker skin. But what does it, does it shock you? Does it upset you? <laughs> what do you think? Yes. Reminds me of a sermon we heard well, probably 20 years ago from a, a young pastor-to-be who did a uh, sermon on what does Jesus look like. It was the most profound mm -hmm. sermon because he had a lot of slides and he was mixed race. And he said, if you were elsewhere in the world where Blacks were the prominent race, then you would see a Black Jesus or the Black Madonna. And uh, it was so profound. And he ended with Jesus was Jewish, and yet we never see a Jewish depiction of Jesus that way. And I won't say never because there's a lot of artwork out there I haven't no, seen. But, but every time I think of this, every time I see another movie on Hollywood where Jesus is white European, I just, I'm like, not even worth my time. Long hair, blue eyes, <laughs> yeah. like that Jesus knocking on the door. I yeah. know everybody had that on their yeah. house. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think, I think it's really interesting because this is after, this is after the, 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 after the resurrection. And the disciples don't recognize Jesus accompanies them on the road to Emmaus, but they don't really recognize him. Uh, and I think it's wonderful because it's a Jesus that, first of all, that does this, this, this joyous meal together with the wine and pizza. This is beer. beer. <laughs> beer. beer. <laughs> but I know. Uh, but it, it is um, yeah, I, the joy in it. Isn't yeah, it? I love it. And, and, and how, how, and, and Jesus. So how do we know if, if 
serpent more interesting than seeing a serial figure with a white robe walking down the road with their mask or sitting at the table. It's like, is this a real flash of light? I think it's extremely interesting. They also notice that the red dress mm -hmm. is the sign of a fallen woman. I think that Jesus is wearing the red dress to identify with any other comments? Well, if the, if the hand is that's up there, it's belonging to that, that you know, person. Um, there's a, a Pierce, uh, Joseph Pierce hand. Well, that's supposed to be Jesus. Yeah. I think he, his hands, the, right. the one, yeah, that's Jesus, right? But the dress, the, the dress is there, and it's like a red dress. The, you wouldn't know this was if you were just no. to see this. You would not know it's up with the pure cat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sort of a halo on the back, but that would be. Yeah, yeah. The white halo. Yeah. yeah. But the, the joy on the disciples' faces, I just, you know, if they're not, of course, they're ordinary, low class, low class people. And, uh, but the, the other comments. Looks like there's an ashtray right by the one guy's hand. Yeah, it does look like an ashtray. <laughs> yes, Susan? No, there's just a lot of energy and movement. Uh huh. Yeah. That was my comment. <laughs> so much energy. Anybody's happy. Oh, yeah, definitely. It destroys stereotypes. It's it destroys I stereotypes, yeah. exactly. Jerry? Well, I was just noticing, you know, in the colors and everything that you use. It's so similar to the earlier painting, you know, the blues, that red, you know, where Don Carlo was existing, and that uh -huh. brings all that together in a modern perspective. Yeah, he had, there were many. He had, if you look up his name, there's lots of others he painted, uh, like a crucified Jesus and looks like in a subway car or something. Uh, really, they, they, Make it big. <laughs> Any other comments? Yes. Kind of, um, yeah. It makes me think of Nadia Gold Swimmer. I don't know if you've read the book. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, how, you know, she was homeless and an alcoholic, and, and then when somebody on the street died, they came to her and said, You're going to have to do the funeral because you're the only person who gets this God stuff that you've been telling us about. And, and so the whole idea, I think, um, I think Hollywood has just done a huge disservice to the picture of who that is, you know, the big daddy in the sky with his head, and we're ready to zap you if you make a misstep. And, um, and I think for people who haven't heard this story, to be able to be told, yeah, Jesus is like me, or the, the people who live in an African country and all of them um, have black skin, and every picture of Jesus they see is blonde hair and blue eyes, how can you say, that's, that's my Jesus too. So I, I really like the painting. I think it, it, it helps reach out and the vessel of the world, not a vessel of that. I agree. It speaks to the common people who end up all people. I think we have to stop it. I have so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was the last one. Oh. And it's, yeah. <laughs> it's